This morning we're in Daniel chapter 5. I imagine that Christmas purchases are underway for the organized and disciplined among us and the terror of a empty Christmas purchase bin is underway for those of us who wait until the last minute. Uh, I doubt that many of you will be purchasing a particular commentary as a gift this year called The Grizzly Man. Perhaps you've heard of this commentary. The Grizzly Man was a documentary by German director, uh, I think his name is Werner Herzog, and it's about a man named Timothy Treadwell. Timothy Treadwell was fascinated by grizzly bears. Fascinated by grizzly bears. So much so that he sought to live among them and track them for about 13 years. He lived and tracked in close proximity to these, these grizzly bears. And if you don't uh, have some stirring of trembling fear in your heart, the thought of that, then you should. Um, he should have, actually, because at the end, his proximity to these grizzly bears resulted in his death. He apparently began to believe that he had a relationship with these grizzly bears, that he could relate to them with a degree of confidence. Even one quote I read said he began to believe that they trusted him. Well, eventually, Timothy and his girlfriend Annie were killed and devoured by one of the bears he was close to. When I heard that story, I was struck, as I'm sure many people would be, by the foolishness, the brazen pride of someone that would think they could live in comfort and ease and security with a, a, a beast so much more powerful, so much more ferocious and under no obligation to operate with this kind of peer level comfort. Well, this morning we're going to read a story about a person that is infinitely more brazen infinitely more proud and in infinitely greater danger than Timothy Treadwell was tracking those grizzly bears. Let's begin reading. As I did last week, we'll read through this story one section at a time, and once we make it through the story, then, then we'll take some application for us as a church. Let's begin reading in verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, and that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. We were going to caption this little snapshot, we might call it a banquet of blasphemy. A banquet of blasphemy. Immediately on verse 1, we're introduced to a new ruler in Babylon. Last thing we heard, King Nebuchadnezzar was ruling. He had been humbled, uh, mightily humbled from the Lord. He'd been driven out of his kingdom into the field like a beast. Eventually, he acknowledged the greatness and sovereignty of God. And chapter 4 concludes with his declaration that the Lord's dominion is everlasting and that all people and rulers must bow in humility before him. Well, immediately we skip Many, many years, decades go by between the end of chapter 4 and verse 1 of chapter 5. And this is a new ruler. It's not necessarily the case that when he says Nebuchadnezzar, his father, that doesn't necessarily mean his immediate biological father. That word, you could think of that as successor, might have been called a father. So this was a, an eventual descendant or maybe a successor of, of the rule of Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar. What might have been called his son in that sense. 
So many, many years, decades have gone by, and now we have a new ruler in Babylon, and he makes a great feast, and this is essentially a drinking party, and he has a thousand of his most prestigious lords, fellow rulers in Babylon, and their wives, and they're drinking, and apparently this wine is too good to have any ordinary cup, so he calls for these special sacred vessels that would have been used in the temple service in Jerusalem to be brought in and degraded, desecrated, you might say, by the drinking of wine, and not only does he drink wine from them, he then uses them to toast gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood and stone. This is outright defiant blasphemy. This is essentially Belshazzar saying in a graphic way, we are the rulers over the God of Israel. Our gods can be toasted while his sacred holy vessels, and you remember what we said from chapter 1, they represent God. This is symbolically a desecration of God. It's symbolically a statement that God's holiness is only good for our toasts to our God. This is absolute defiance in the face of God. It's treating him, as it were, as worthless in comparison to the greatness of Belshazzar and his gods and his kingdom. Trampling his temple where sacrifices were offered to atone to his holiness by his people. Treating that as worthless. And this seems to be a deliberate act. It seems like he he intentionally goes into storage and takes them out so he can make this public statement. Get get those vessels. You can almost imagine the kind of drunken defiance that's taking. You know what we're going to drink from? I'll tell you what, guys. Go get those temple goblets and bring them in. There's a kind of a belligerence, a a kind of brazenness, a brazen pride. We're going to play with God. We're going to mock God, he seems to say. Banquet of blasphemy. The story keeps going, and there's an immediate interruption. Immediately, in verse 5, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in. But they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. Might caption this snapshot, a terrifying mystery. The intention here in the writer of this narrative is to paint an abrupt and overwhelming contrast from this braggadocious ruler sipping wine out of a holy goblet. He becomes this broken, petrified, almost like a small child. And these mighty gathering of lords and then the gathering of all their magicians and enchanters are rendered helpless in a moment. In a moment, they go from the height of pride and confidence to trembling, helpless, almost a a pathetic, childlike inability to cope with what just took place. With the ease of the appearance of a human hand writing something on a wall, the scene goes from triumph and pride to terror and helplessness. We're supposed to feel that contrast. And you can imagine, again, if you read this from the standpoint of a Jewish exile, which this is written to encourage God's people to comfort them and to point out certain things about God and about the rulers of this world, you would imagine them having perhaps a moment of chuckle. From proud toasts, to trembling. Actually, the phrase there when it says knees knocked together is is just an attempt in English to get across. It basically says he lost control of his bodily functions. 
Commentators say that by implication, that might mean more than just his knees were knocking together. I mean, it's, it's essentially saying this king went from the height of confidence to the height of inability, lack of control, and all that might entail. A terrifying mystery. Once again, the wisdom of Babylon is useless to help the king. And we keep reading. Verse 10, the queen because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Now this queen is apparently not the king's wife, because she was obviously already in attendance. This is probably the queen mother. So some previous ruler, she would have had a position of influence uh, in the nation. And she comes in, and I think a, a key thing we're supposed to feel at this point is a, a further development of humiliation for Nebuchadnezzar. So no one in this prestigious party can do a thing with this word that's written on the wall. They, they can't, none of a thousand lords, all their wives, their concubines, and all the magicians and Chaldeans are helpless. And who comes in? Somebody who wasn't even invited to the party or didn't come. And again, in this culture, I think there's also a, a level of humiliation in the fact that it's his mother that has to come. And you feel a bit of the humiliation, even what she says initially. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There's a bit of condescension in her speech. And again, if you're reading this like the nine-year-old Jewish child of the exile, reading this again, you get another chuckle. Oh, does the poor king need his mommy is a bit of the sense of this. Does the poor king need his mother to comfort him? Does he seem a bit perplexed, confused? Do you need a change of clothing? Do you need help because your body is out of control? You seem a bit perplexed. Don't let your color change, Belshazzar, ruler of Babylon. There's a bit of mockery going on here. There's a sense in which Babylon has become so helpless that somebody who is not included in his big party has to come in from outside, and then it gets worse. Her solution is even worse than her being there. She says, actually, you know the person who could really help you? It's someone that your father, and I think the emphasis on your father, the king, is intended to put Belshazzar in his place. The king... The great king, your father the king, he made this person head over all of these magicians that are worthless. And then the humiliating lowering of the boom comes. It's Daniel, the Israelite. You know the God you were just mocking from that exile? Daniel. He's the guy that can help you. He's the guy that your father said was better than all of these magicians and interpreters. He has to come in and help you. The humiliation in this passage, it just builds. The tension builds and builds. Guess where your solution is going to be found? In wisdom from the one who worships the God you were just mocking. That's what you need, Daniel. And who gets to tell you? The queen mother of all people. And the humiliation continues. I think it's important that we, we feel at times in the Bible the, the literary nature. I've mentioned this before. There's a, there's a literary nature to Scripture. And, and we need to feel it and see it in its literary form. God is never sinful, but there is a sense in which in his holiness, God does put the pride of men in their place. And there's even, we might call it, a mockery that takes place. And you're not going to appreciate these kind of passages if you're thinking of it only as kind of stern commandments. There is a holy, almost a fearful sense of humor about passages like this. It happens in the Old Testament and other places as well. If you've ever heard the story of King Ehud and how he was 
immobilized uh, by a judge of Israel. That's another story like that in the Old Testament. There's a, there's a humorous mocking going on. These kings, this ruler, that presume to exalt themselves over God, that assume they have a kind of power and prestige that God can be mocked, they are put in their place, literally, not just eventually in judgment, but even in the midst of the story, they're shown to be as helpless as they are. I, I, I was... So reminded, reading this passage of Psalm 2, when the writer says, Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. See if you can, you can imagine God thinking this as he's watching this drinking party, drinking the vessels that represent his holiness. You can imagine him thinking Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, and then he will speak to them in his wrath, and he will terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Isn't this a, a, a literary way of that psalm being played out? Simply by the hand appearing and writing on the wall, devastation happens to the pride of this king and his lords. There's a growing tension in this story. Belshazzar clearly is being humbled before the God he has mocked. And then we read the ultimate judgment. Verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, I think in this passage, you, you detect a bit of a, a contrast in Nebuchadnezzar. On the one hand, he desperately needs Daniel's help. On the other hand, he wants to maintain his prestige and rulership over Daniel. So he points out right away, you are an exile, an exile from a broken land. And then you notice again at the end, he wants to point out his need for him, but he also wants to reserve some sense of uncertainty, some skepticism. If, if he says, you can read the writing and make known its interpretation, well then, I will give you some rewards. So you can sense in Nebuchadnezzar, even at this point, even in his terror, even in his helplessness, I mean, all of his magicians are there, they've been worthless. He, even now, he wants to remind Daniel who's in charge and who's the exile. He wants to retain something of his superiority. You're in exile. I've heard you can answer wisdom. If you can do this, I'll reward you. That seems to be the intent of the speech. That there's, there's not a great degree of humiliation taking place in light of how he has been humiliated to this point. His heart has not been humbled. Then Daniel answers. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. And give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was that of the wild donkeys and he was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you... His son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord 
of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent. And this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. And this is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The speech from Daniel begins by establishing the context, a sort of vindication to God. He says, Belshazzar, remember your father, your predecessor, we might say, Nebuchadnezzar. He had almost a godlike greatness, able to take life and give life, able to raise up and tear down. Remember, remember the kind of supreme power, supreme, absolute dominion. No one could exceed the kind of power over life that your, your predecessor had, Belshazzar. Remember that. Remember that. That's where he was. And remember, my God took him all the way down from there and made him less than a man, eating grass like an ox. And the point of all of that was to reveal that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of men. And then he lowers the boom. You knew all of that. You knew it all. You knew that story. There could only be one conclusion from the evidence before you, and that is God rules over all. But in spite of that inescapable evidence, Belshazzar, not only did you ignore it, you defied that very God. Not only did you ignore all that evidence, you decided to mock that God. You worshiped gods of silver and gold. You took his vessels and drank from them. In spite of all of your knowledge, your heart has defied God, Belshazzar. And God holds your very breath in his hands, he says. You worship these breathless idols. If you want to know who holds your breath, it's the God who has been mocked in this party. Belshazzar. God has sent his judgment on you because you have failed to humble yourself before him. Then he interprets the writing. The way their language and grammar was, these words uh, could have been interpreted either as nouns or as as verbs. That might be why the magicians couldn't make any sense of it. It might have been a a declining sense of numerical values. You might think of a a talent, a shekel, a half shekel, something along those lines. A talent, a shekel, a divided shekel. Mene, mene, take el parson. But you could also interpret it as verbs. And Daniel perceives that that's the ultimate theological meaning that God is sending. Numbered, found wanting, divided. And he sees what God is saying. Through divine insight, he sees your days have been numbered. God decide when your kingdom would start and when it would end. And in evaluating your kingship and your rulership under his sovereignty, he has found you wanting. You have fallen short, Belshazzar. You are short of the mark. You have fallen short. I might think of the New Testament where it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've weighed you, Belshazzar, and you have fallen short. And here is the result. Divided. We might think of the word broken. Broken. Taken. Shattered. Gone. Enough of you, God says. Your great strength and pride I've numbered I've weighed, and now I will break. And then perhaps the most abrupt fulfillment in the Bible. Verse 29, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. 
That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Remarkable fulfillment, immediate fulfillment. Never has there been a man of whom it was so true what Jonathan Edwards said, that sinful men walk over the covering of hell as it were over a rotten board, as it was for Belshazzar. The same night he's drinking and mocking God, God has appointed death. You will die broken. And not just you, but your kingdom over. In a moment of drinking and feasting and confidence and exaltation in their power and pride, even over God himself, God says, tonight your soul is required of you and all you have gathered, whose will it be? Over, Belshazzar. Done. Broken. Completed. The head of gold topples. In comes the next kingdom. In reading this story, there's a, an inescapable conclusion for the kingdoms of men, for men and women everywhere. The defiance of God's holiness will result in God's judgment. The defiance of God's holiness will result in God's judgment. That's the lesson of Belshazzar. And again, as I mentioned last week, we as Americans tend to almost immediately jump to sort of a, a personal connection with the lead character in a story. It's kind of our John Wayne heritage. I'm supposed to relate to the hero, you know, or whoever he is. I just, I'm, it's a moral lesson, so you and Belshazzar. But I, I don't think that's the first point that an Israelite exile would, would take from this. The first point he would take is Belshazzar represents a kingdom of this world that has oppressed God's people, that has defied God. He sort of represents Babylon and all of its greatness. And their first point would be, look, the, the Babylon that seemed impregnable, that seemed impossible, that it could ever be defeated, that conquered the world, it's gone in a night. At the height of their confidence and arrogance, it's gone. Commentators speculate that perhaps the Median and Persian army, which did historically conquer Babylon, was literally outside the gates. And perhaps because of the greatness of their wall, uh, which was impressive, uh, apparently Belshazzar had no fear. Absolute confidence, even though this enemy army is right there and he's drinking and, and toasting defiance to God even as the enemy is at the gates. And history records that they came in and they, <laughs> they killed Belshazzar. He was eventually killed. And this records, it happened the very night this feast took place. The defiance of God's holiness will result in God's judgment. Babylon comes to an end. A couple of contextual things that it's, it's very important that we notice we could potentially miss. First of all, remember that decades upon decades, perhaps more than 50 years, has passed since Daniel was first taken. So at this point, Daniel is a much older, perhaps even an old man. You could skip over that because chapter 4 and chapter 5 just bump right up to each other. But when Daniel walks in, the last time we saw him, he was a relatively young man. He walks in, now his, his hair is gray. And he's endured years and years under exile. That might be part of the point of the reference of Darius' age, if you notice that. 62 years old seems like a unnecessary point. But at the very least, it reminds us, God had appointed the end of Babylon the moment it took Israel out of its land. From its beginning, it had an end. And the man who would eventually succeed this nation, God, God was watching his whole life and knew exactly the moment it would happen. God was watching the whole exile. He knew exactly the moment that Belshazzar would topple and Babylon would fall and the Medo-Persian Empire would take over rulership of the world. He knew the moment that would happen. Now Daniel had to wait essentially a lifetime under Babylon until this moment when he's a much, much older man and he stands and says, the kingdom is taken from you, Belshazzar. It's gone. Very important contextual point. Another contextual point that it's very important to remember, and that is that Babylon in the Bible takes a kind of symbolic status. This happens all the way back from the book of Genesis when the Tower of Babel, essentially the same word and in the same place, tried to lift itself up before God. The Tower of Babel where they said, let's build a city to the heavens 
and God comes down and humbles them. And then Babylon, the great destroyer of the temple, the destroyer of God's people, it it takes on this kind of symbolic representation, not just of this one kingdom, but of all the kingdoms of this earth, and particularly those who seek to subjugate God's people. Babylon becomes almost a watchword for God's people. It becomes a representation of all the temporary kingdoms of this earth and their pride and defiance of God. And you can tell that when you, when you look actually later uh, in the Bible at the very end when John the Apostle is talking about the, the kingdoms of this world, he describes them as Babylon. Even though Babylon doesn't exist as a nation, that's what I mean, it's, it becomes a kind of symbolic kingdom representing those that defy God and will finally be judged by God and replaced. Revelation 18, 1 through 5, it says... After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright uh, with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Verse 4, And then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So as Christians, we can look at this moment, and certainly there is a a moment in time and a person in time that was actually humbled, Belshazzar, but in a a broader, more historic, and a a kind of fully biblical way, we can also say this is a a sort of a microcosm, a symbol of what's happening ultimately in history. Ultimately, all of the Babylons will fall. Ultimately, all of the kingdoms that defy God will be replaced. Ultimately, this banquet is happening to this day, and it is just as fearful a banquet now as it was then. Ultimately, these defiant toasts are happening today, and they're just as fearful now as they were then. Ultimately, the attempt to defy God's holiness continues till the final day, and on that final day, the same judgment will be rendered, numbered, found wanting, broken. So how do we apply this to our lives? If you think about an Israelite and how they would apply it, I think that helps us to think through how, we, how do we apply this story, this lesson. Well, number one, we endure the rule of Babylon. We endure the rule of Babylon. It's helpful to remember Daniel and the other exiles year after year after year, decade after decade enduring the ups and downs of Nebuchadnezzar at his worst and then Nebuchadnezzar at his best and then he dies and other kings come in and then there's plots and and overthrows of governments and then now we have this new upstart Belshazzar and he's as bad as Nebuchadnezzar ever was he's defying God you can see these ups and downs of the kingdoms of this world and Daniel is in prominence and then apparently he's been forgotten He's been demoted. He's been relegated outside the inner circle of cultural power. Though once he had great prominence. And we can see the reality of Christians in that endurance. Uh, Sometimes Christians have great cultural prominence and God uses them in mighty ways before emperors and kings and to influence society for good. And And then other times it seems that power is taken from them. And the point is not that there'll be this escalating greatness of power again and again and again until the end. No, it's more like what happened to Daniel. There's going to be moments of prominence and then moments of of, of greater persecution and exile from the halls of power. So for an Israelite reading this and realizing, well, Babylon concluded, but on the other hand, uh, there's, there's new problems. God's final kingdom hasn't come in yet. Uh, uh, Apparently the next kingdom is going to be somewhat like the previous kingdom. You can imagine reading this story if you're a Jew at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, the ruler who desecrated the temple and and being encouraged and saying, well, this has happened before and that ruler will meet his end just like Belshazzar met his end and then Nero will meet his end just like Belshazzar did and then the next ruler and Hitler will meet his end. There's always going to be a new ruler who acts this way and they will finally meet their end. So this story reminds Christians, endure. Endure. Endure the present rule of Babylon. Babylon will come to an end. Second application. Reject the banquet of Babylon. Endure the rule of Babylon. Reject the banquet. You can imagine Jews living in exile were tempted. They were tempted to just join in the party. 
Just, just assimilate. Just join in the fun. What's the big deal? Let's not be so uptight about holiness all the time. It's kind of funny to be intemperate, drinking from a temple vessel. It's kind of funny, isn't it? And you can see that same temptation with Christians today. Isn't it kind of funny how religious people take stuff so seriously? It's kind of goofy. It's kind of funny. It's kind of silly how seriously they take things all the time. Let's make light of it. I was struck as I was thinking about this temptation to join the banquet of all the, all the kind of late night personalities and commentators. And, and I thought, boy, most of what's considered funny today is cynicism towards things that are considered serious. That's most of what people think of as funny today. It's, it's to make light of something that someone else takes very seriously. Mostly God. It's, it's kind of funny that people take things so seriously. That those Christians take God so seriously. Chill out. What's the big deal? What's the big deal about human life in the womb? What's the big deal about drunkenness? What's the big deal about getting high? What's the big deal about cheating? What's the big deal about stealing? What's the big deal about immorality? What's the big deal? Let's have fun. It's a party. The what's the big deal culture, it's just Babylon saying, come over here. We got some wine to drink and some toasts to make. And underneath it all is defiance of the holiness of God. I was struck in a particular way for second generation uh, in the church kind of kids and people, of which I'm one, if you grow up in the church. And it just struck me how true it is for uh, young people like that grew up in a Christian household to assume so much confidence in their lifestyle. But look at Belshazzar as an example. He knew everything about the greatness of God, and yet that led him to a place of utter defiance and disregard. Belshazzar wasn't made safe by Nebuchadnezzar's humility. The modern child of a Christian is not made safe by their parents' faith. They need to take a lesson from Belshazzar. You can know everything, and in the end, it will only increase your judgment because knowing it all, you ignore it all. If you're a child of a Christian, let, let me encourage you, study this passage and take it seriously. Are you just drifting through life, ignoring what happened to your mother and father and assuming, I, I have no need to hold on to the holiness of God the way my father did? Belshazzar was not redeemed because his father humbled himself. The kingdom of Babylon was not saved because its former king acknowledged God's glory. Application number three. Discount the wisdom of Babylon. Discount the wisdom of Babylon. It's an important point in this text. It's emphasized both in the speech of the queen... And in the helplessness of the wise men before she comes in, that their wisdom is worthless when it comes to the real need of the kingdom. I mean, here, imagine the irony of this. You have all the magicians, all the Chaldeans, the enchanters, the astrologers. You have three words, one repeated, on a wall. And the ultimate outcome of that is the destruction of the entire kingdom. I mean, wouldn't you want a wise man that can at least predict your kingdom is going to end tonight? What good is a wise man that can't even predict that? What good is wisdom that can't even point out the end of the world is here? What good is it? What, good, what kind of an enchanter are these guys? Is it just parlor tricks and I can give you a little bit of a comfort on your bad day when you're sick and you can't even tell me what's going to happen when my life's going to end? What kind of a prophet are you? That's the ironic mocking point that God is making of all the earthly wise men of every age. When it comes to real wisdom, it's worthless. It's useless. It's pointless. Not only is it not enough, it's totally helpless in the face of real need. And that's true today. The wisdom of this world, it 
it's useless. All the philosophies, all the philosophy departments that talk about socionomic progress and the development of the human state and anthropological development over the ages and the enlightenment, the effect it's had and postmodernism and how we now discovered that truth is relative. All these kind of developments over the years. You know what they're worth? Nothing. Nothing in the end. Nothing. Because they can't stop that same hand writing on the wall the end of every person in their final day. Discount the wisdom of Babylon. It's worthless. Can't see anything. It sees what is plain and discerns nothing. It's like Belshazzar. He sees, but he sees nothing. He hears, but he hears nothing. He knows, but he knows nothing. That's like the wisdom of this world. Let me encourage you, uh, just a warning. Everything you read and watch is trying to convince you it has wisdom for the interpretation of life. But unless that wisdom is grounded in the wisdom of the Bible and ultimately a wisdom that's counted foolish in the world because it's the wisdom of a crucified Messiah that establishes a kingdom not of this world, that wisdom is just deceptive and it can't ultimately save you. It can't finally deliver you in that final moment when that hand writes on the wall and the Babylon of your world comes crashing down. And even Christians need to remember this because we get caught up in the wisdom of this world and here's what you need, here's what you need to have, here's how you need to think, and here's the ridiculousness of human thinking. And we need to get back to the wisdom of God that's foolishness to this world, the wisdom that says there is a king and he was crucified on a cross and he's actually the Messiah, contrary to all the expectations of this world. What does Paul say? Jews seek signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to us who believe, the power and wisdom of God. Discount the wisdom of Babylon. This story reveals, look how worthless it was. Look how useless in the real moment. Finally, trust the alternative to Babylon. Trust the alternative to Babylon. In the short term, the Babylonian alternative, the replacement of Babylon, was Persia and Media, Medo-Persian kingdom. Now, a Jew reading this, we wouldn't be thinking this way because this is a long time ago, but a Jew reading this would catch an immediate sense of excitement to hear Darius the Mede came to the throne. Now, we don't know why because we, we didn't live back then, but here's why. It was the Persian king Cyrus that sent all the Jews home. So if you're a little Jewish boy reading this story in the years between Babylon and the coming of Jesus, this is the part of the story where all the kids go, ah, after it all, Babylon, its final night, you know what happened? At the end of the final night, they're blaspheming God. You know what happens? In comes the kingdom that sends all the, the Jewish exiles home. He, here he comes in, this, this man who's related to a king who's going to send all the people home. The, the end of the exile. Babylon doesn't endure, but you know what does? God's kingdom. And God's people in his kingdom. That's, that's the point. Even in spite of their apparent weakness, even through all the years of exile, even through the defiance and blasphemy of this king, at the end, he topples, you know, who comes in? No less than the kingdom that will finally send all the Jewish exiles home. There's an alternative kingdom. It may appear weak, but it will endure. It will endure. And of course, that return was temporary, and we know this is just a, another snapshot, a temporary snapshot of what was going to happen. But of course, we get to the New Testament and we, we remember the prophecy of Daniel. He said, look, one day, all of these kingdoms are going to come to an end. Remember, he said that earlier in the book. He says, look, all the, the head of gold and silver and then bronze. And there's going to be a kingdom of iron and all these kingdoms are just going to roll one after another. But in the end, there's going to be a kingdom that's never going to be replaced. It's going to last forever. So when we read this about Babylon... We can't help but think, look, I, I want to be a part of the kingdom that will never topple. The kingdom that will never end. The kingdom that will endure past all of these kingdoms. That's the, that's the kingdom you want to be in on. 
I don't want to be in a kingdom that seems impressive for a while, but then topples with some drunken, bragging king boasting over the king of heaven. I want to be a part of the kingdom of the king of heaven who could never be toppled. That's why it's so valuable if we know this background when Jesus says in Mark 1, 14 through 15, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Discount the wisdom of Babylon and also trust the alternative. Babylon. What's, what's the alternative? Well, there's only one ultimate alternative. Because we get a strong sense in Daniel, and then you see it again in Revelation. Though there are different kinds of kingdoms, they all ultimately look a lot like Babylon. They rise and fall. There's pride. There's some that are a little better, some a little worse. But they, they just keep rolling through history. And the point of this book is, look, look to the ultimate alternative. There's a kingdom that will never go away. There's a king who will never be toppled. And that king doesn't look kingly to the wisdom of this world because he came to establish a kingdom of sinners. He came to establish a kingdom of people who were at that banquet, who toasted the defiance of God. And there has to be a reconciliation because this is going to be a kingdom of no one. It's going to be an empty kingdom. And so the king comes, and what does he do? He dies on a cross. Why? Because all of his future citizens of the kingdom were at that banquet and toasted defiance of that God. And that sin had to be paid for because this is going to be a pure kingdom. And so he dies for that toasting of God's defiance. And he receives that judgment on himself. And he establishes a new kingdom, not of this earth. And he says, repent, come from the banquet, and believe the good news. Believe the good news. You can be a part of the kingdom that will never topple, that will never fade. And your sins will be forgiven. You'll, you'll enter into the dominion of a king that will last forever and ever. Let me pull you away from that place where you're walking over hell on a rotten covering like Belshazzar was and into a kingdom where you're secure and safe under the covering of a king who can atone for your defiance and who will receive that judgment on himself. The judgment of Babylon for all of God's people fell on Jesus so that that judgment could be replaced with citizenship in a kingdom that would never be taken away. That's the good news. This story, through all the centuries, just reminded God's people, celebrate that you're in a kingdom that will never be toppled. You have to endure the rule of these petty, apparent kingdoms, but that kingdom will last forever, and one day all of the Babylons will be wiped away. And the kingdom of our Lord and of the Lord Jesus Christ has become the kingdom of this world and will last forever. And we will reign with him. And if you're not a Christian, the appeal of this passage is run away from the banquet in Babylon. Its end is swift and its judgment is certain. Run away from it and run to the king who can protect and preserve you forever. Don't dine with Belshazzar. Dine with Jesus the kingdom that will never end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in your goodness, kindness, love, favor, mercy, and that all of those attributes are present in your kingdom. And we rejoice to be citizens of your kingdom, Lord, because of your gospel. Because of your blood, Lord, we have entered into your dominion. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We rejoice in that, Lord. And we pray for those that are our neighbors and our friends and our relatives, Lord, who are still dining at that same banquet. Lord, and before their judgment falls, would you give us the grace to invite them to a better kingdom? Give us the grace to do that, Lord, we pray. Bless this season as we celebrate the King come as a man. In Jesus' name.
Amen.